Oops. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Oops, I think that got me. There we go. Do you want to go back to the beginning? There's a little slide for you and an acknowledgement. Thanks, Karen. Luckily, we didn't miss too much. <laughs> yeah. A bit no. slow, aren't I? <laughs> it's all right. So, end of a long day. Um, so, I've been growing my own food, and that was in Shepparton as a child uh, when I was about eight. Uh, my family were really keen food growers on my on my mum's side. So my grandfather was an orchardist and vegetable grower. And then when he retired, he had kind of a block next door as big as his house block to grow veggies and fruit on. So I grew up with that that kind of learning experience was I'm uh, really lucky. And um, I ended up going into horticulture, starting at Melbourne Zoo. Then I went to Burnley as an apprentice, apprentice gardener, went to Burnley College to study nursery management, which was really good to learn about propagation. And then I also was lucky enough to, amongst other training, to spend time with Bill Mollison and David, and, um, not David Holmgren, sorry, and um, Jeff Lawton at, while Bill Mollison was still around for a PDC or Permaculture Design Certificate. And as Lee and I were discussing when we were waiting for people, you're, you're all, everyone to come on board, you're always learning. And so my garden in Melbourne has at least at any time 200 edible and useful plants including about 40 or 50 native edible plants. So I'm always learning and experimenting and pushing the boundaries of things. And uh, it's really important to know that there's always lots of different ways of doing things. And you're always going to have things that succeed one year and don't another and a problem that you've never come across before, a problem pest. or So don't, don't feel discouraged. It's a, it's a continuous learning journey. That's probably a good thing to mention at the beginning. So this is now also just checking. I've never actually checked this before. You're getting my screen. Are you seeing all the photos of the, the videos of people across the presentation or not, Lee? The video, uh, we're seeing a column of people who are Okay. Present. I'm yeah. going to shrink it because otherwise it, it messes up the text. Sorry about that. I've never checked that before. I'm oh, just kind of ignor I've ignored well, it. Well, it looks good at the moment, but... Okay, yeah. I'm going to shrink it down. Yep. Just because I've got text on either side and it gets a bit confusing. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just have me moving it around all the time. Uh, so this is my back garden in Melbourne and uh, to the in the middle of the screen to your to your left, the left of the picture is, ta is some tamarillo leaves. In the back right-hand corner is, uh, wait a minute, maybe, sorry, bear with me. Um, I'm not sure how to, anyway, sorry. Okay, it's all right. Uh, avocado tree in the back corner. There's a thornless blackberry. I just realized you can't see me talking either. So I don't know how frustrating that is. And there's a wildness there that I hope you can appreciate. So down the bottom right-hand corner, there's feverfew. And that is something that's great for hoverflies. There's things going to seed in there. There's probably some, some celery and some, Pass. I think that celery actually going to see there. Um, there's all sorts of things happening. So I wanted you to be inspired by that and think, well, it doesn't have to be super neat and tidy. It's just great to get things in there and, and try them out. Uh, so things that you need to consider are things that this is a bit of an overview we're going to discuss tonight is your site. That's really important. Uh, also very, very importantly for productive gardens, especially is the soil. And also you as a gardener. So it's really important to consider your time constraints, uh, your habits, things like that. And we'll go through what that means as we go through, as we head through the presentation. Um, we're going to cover various vegetables, particularly those that are really easy and discourage you from growing some that are not because it's all about encouragement when you're a beginning gardener. We really want you to have um, good results and success. And so that will lead you on to more adventures and, and um, you know, more successes rather than trying out something really hard and being discouraged. Herbs are great to grow. And so we've, we've got a bit of a discussion about those as well. And some fruiting plants. Um, we're going to go through different ways of gardening, such as container gardening and, and talk about some of the issues with those. We're going to touch on some pests and diseases. I mean, as, as Lee or other people would know, you could have an entire presentation and still not cover all the pests and diseases that um, plague our, our productive gardens. <laughs> That's just part of life. 
a little bit about how to use the plants in the kitchen and a very extensive reference uh, this reference slide section at the end for you to use later. Hmm. Sorry, it's misbehaving. It's, uh, there we go. So this is my nature strip garden in Melbourne. And um, as Lee might know, it's possibly a little bit not fitting with um, guidelines. <laughs> But uh, I have I have asked to be involved in the fruit tree trial for nature strips in in Melbourne in in Moreland, I should say. So there's some you can see a pair of pistachio trees there. You can also see some hedging of herbs and society garlic and daylilies to try and keep things in. And you can also see some little signs that are really really useful with the nature strip garden. Um, to try to, um, you know, to guide usage of it so people know when to harvest or, or when to leave something if it's just been planted. And, and also, importantly, some of the names of plants so they know what they're harvesting when you're sharing it with your neighbours. So one thing you need to consider when you're planning a garden is, uh, is try to use as much space as possible. So that's why I've included nature strips. Uh, it is a lot more to go through. You have to go through a permit system, but it's still really worth it if you if you're able to do that. If you have a nature strip to use and you're not on a busy road where it's going to cause issues with line of sight with cars, etc. This is a very quiet street with a um, a closed end. Uh, raised beds might be what you use. You could consider vertical gardening or containers. Uh, a really good thing to remember is don't be too ambitious at the beginning. So between one to three square meters is a really good size to start with and the 10 square meters that you see suggested there is directly from diggers nursery in um, Heron, heronswood or all over victoria now and that is the amount that they suggest one person needs now that does also include some herbs and some fruit so as a rough guideline because it also does depend on what plants you're growing and how many vegetables you eat so it's a, it's a very broad broad question but it gives you some idea that if you don't have 10 square meters you might not be able to grow all your veggies so be realistic about what you're going to grow and then also you need to think about well what fruit do you want to grow and then um, you need to think about what you want to grow what's possible and then what's possible to grow in your in your microclimate whether it's sunny or shady and sheltered or or open and and then you're marrying those two together and then you can actually decide what you're going to grow so you need to do some research. So I've touched or mentioned microclimate earlier and microclimate's really important. Now, let me just move this. Um, no, sorry. Is there a way to shrink the, the, um, the videos, Lee, so there's not so many people? So that it's not impacting on the screen view. I'm sorry about this, people. I think um, that might just be your own screen. Yeah. Oh, you can't see that. I think it is. I think you can oh, okay. just, you can choose a particular setting for what for your screen okay. setting. Yes. Okay. I think everyone else is fine. Okay. That's all right then. Right. That's what I was trying to ask before. Uh, so microclimate looks at how much sun or shade you might have in your particular garden area, or you might have several garden areas and they might be vastly different from each other. And often small gardens, which many people have uh, in, in, a, in, the, in an urban setting, have either uh, very deep shade, not always, but they can often have very deep shade or they can have very exposed or very, uh, like, like Lee was talking before about her garden being a bit of a sun trap. And that can be great in winter, but it can be an issue in summer. So you do need to know what your garden is going to deliver to you in the way of climatic conditions. and that affects what you're going to be able to grow, but it also does mean that you might need to take into account protection at different times of the year. Particularly vegetables, they often need protection in one way or another. So it's best to think about those systems before you start and make room to accommodate those within your garden. So have a really good, uh, a really good look at your garden, 
sit in it and feel the warmth, feel the sun, feel the reflected heat or the retained heat coming off buildings or concrete paths. That can be a real issue with, with, with garden beds right next to them. And rain shadow is another thing too in small spaces that you might not consider. And you think, oh, there's been rain, there should be an issue with uh, the garden being being well watered, but you may have a situation where the rain is coming in from a certain angle and your fence is here, the rain comes across and plants right next to the fence are missing that rain. So you do have to be aware of all of these things. And vegetables are far less forgiving than perennial herbs or, or indeed fruit trees once they get their roots into the ground because they're, they're able to survive for longer periods as a, as a longer term plant. But veg, vegetables being mostly annuals or many of them we're going to look at tonight are annuals, um, they are far more affected by any small change. So you do have to uh, be aware. Lack of airflow can be an issue. Protected areas are great for bringing things on in early spring, for instance, but lack of airflow can later on in summer, late summer mean um, diseases caused by too much humidity or not enough airflow. So you may have to then prune some of your zucchini leaves, for instance, to allow for better airflow. So just be constantly aware of what you're looking at in your garden. Now we're getting on to the nitty gritty, so to speak. I'm just going to turn a light on so I'm not speaking in the dark as it's, as it's getting darker here. Uh, so if you have sandy soil, the features of that is that of course it has really good drainage, but along with the water goes the nutrients. So it's really important to try to encourage your sandy soil to hold more. And you can add um, a natural additive called bentonite and that can, uh, bentonite clay. And it's um, frequently advertised in Western Australia because they garden on pure sand. It can be diff more difficult to get in Victoria, but it is available. I've seen it in the last two or three years even in the big, the big um, hardware show stores. So you know, your good local nursery should be able to order it for you. You can hopefully order it online or get it from the big B. So it is out there if you do have sandy soil. Not that many people, well, I shouldn't say that. There's people down the coast that have very sandy soil. Um, many of the north, moorland area at least has he quite heavy clay. So that's not an issue for us um, gardeners in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, Organic matter you can just seem to put onto sandy soil and it just disappears like quicksand, literally. Uh, clay soil, the, the opposite of that, has quite poor drainage, but it does hold nutrients really well. And there's a phrase I learned years ago in gardening that clay breaks your back as a gardener, clay breaks your back, but sand breaks your heart because you're putting all these, these goodies onto your soil and there's just, you're just not getting much out of, out of it. So. Um, and as I've written down the bottom, most soils are a blend of these two, and that's more what you're aiming for is the midpoint, which is why I put the loam soil in the beginning in the middle, which drains well but still holds moisture. I used to think that was a, a really um, a kind of an opposite thing. That the plant, you'd look up what a plant needs, and it would say free draining soil that doesn't dry out, and you'd think, well. I don't understand. That seems like the opposite to each other, but it's it's a balance that you're needing. It's a kind of a Goldilocks soil situation, if that makes sense. Um, so clay soil can be helped usually by gypsum, and the tests to find out if you uh, can benefit from gypsum being used in your in your clay soil is by putting a small dollop, maybe a teaspoon or two teaspoons worth of clay soil into a jar of water overnight. Now in the morning, if there's any cloudiness in the water, if there's any what's called dispersal, or if there's if the, if the clay soil is broken up altogether into sludge, then yay, you can get gain benefit from gypsum. So um, go ahead and put gypsum on and we'll get to the rates of those later. And of course, sandy soil and clay soil both benefit from organic matter. So these this is kind of your, like your magic recipe for um, growing most vegetables. Uh, I've just put at the very beginning, the Veggie Safe program from Macquarie University in Sydney is, it used to be free, but now it's only $20 for five or six samples, I believe. Uh, I just can't remember now. I haven't sent one for a while for anybody. And so you go online and you look up Veggie Safe and they've got a really good program going where they're trying to get information or map the, the soil contaminants around Australia. And so because of that, they are able to offer this really, really cheap soil testing for heavy metals and other 
harsh contaminants in the soil that can be poisonous if um, if that soil is used to grow vegetables in. So you then have to look up um, more information on uh, on what levels are a problem. There's that you need to do further in further. Uh, you go right through their website anyway and have a good look at that. But that that is a really good starting point for finding out if you have contaminants, which a lot of urban gardeners find that they do. But out of interest, before VeggieSafe, I found another soil testing place because VeggieSafe wasn't around years ago. And I sent some soil samples off from my garden in Melbourne. And ironically, the two areas I'd been growing lots of food in had high, not, not unsafe, but elevated levels of lead compared to um, that was still within biodynamic standards, so it's still okay. But they were the highest areas and I have no idea why. And the nature strip was the cleanest soil in the whole garden. So um, yeah, you just never know um, without testing. So testing is a really good starting point in particularly in urban areas. But even in country areas, there could be a history. If you don't know the history of your soil, you don't know what's, you know, whether there was uh, any kind of previous contamination from all sorts of things, whether it was commercial, um, factories or it could also be commercial agriculture or agriculture itself can be can, a, a lot of really harsh sprays chemicals were used years ago so yes it is worth looking into you need to remove all your weeds I mean that kind of goes without saying but it's really important to acquaint yourself with the what a perennial weed so at the top you see got the lovely dandelion very useful you can eat the flowers the leaves the roots all that sort of thing but it's just a pest in the garden because it has very deep tap roots that means it's very nutritious and it's a great herb to eat great plant to eat or great weed or herb to eat or use for medicine or for food but those deep roots means mean that uh, that's like they go down and they it's called a nutrient miner they take nutrients from deep in what's they usually like growing in clay soil and bring them up to the surface into the leaves for you to access them. That's great, but it makes it really hard to get rid of them. So you need to get a, a nice uh, long fork and try to, and especially loosen, loosen the soil by watering it really well beforehand. So when there's been some good rains, that's the time to go out and do your weeding and try and get those deep tap roots out as much as you can. Cooch grass and kaikuya. So the middle picture is kaikuya. Uh, they tend to grow just under the soil surface uh, in, depending on how deep your friable soil is, friable meaning fluffy and loose, they may grow only 10 centimetres deep or they can grow up to 30 centimetres deep if you're really unlucky and if you, have, if you have sandy soil. So the only way to really get those out is to mattock them out like a carpet. So or dig them out with a shovel. But matticking is really going to be the most effective. So you're going to have to head off to a hardware shop or a nursery and buy yourself one of those tools and um, learn some good bending over, um, you know, good ergonomic techniques for doing that kind of work because it can be really rough on your back. So us short people, great at digging out kakuya. <laughs> I've done a lot of that. Um, Oxalis down the bottom or sow sob is a weed of winter. So you sometimes don't even know you have it. And when I started my Melbourne garden 30 odd years ago, I enthusiastically dug over my whole front garden, thereby bringing all the old oxal the tiny oxalis bulbs that were down too low to um, germinate to grow up to the surface. And so in in winter, after you know digging it over at, at a time of year where the oxalis was dormant, I had almost an entire front garden of oxalis, which was fairly uh, depressing. <laughs> so. It took me a couple of years to really get rid of those. And uh, can I tell you that digging them out, it's not the most effective. You are better really to just pull the tops off, when, especially when they're flowering. And that's a time when most of the energy is above ground. And so you're stripping the energy out of the bulbs as much as possible. So it's worthwhile researching the tactics for getting rid of your weeds. Uh, solarizing can work reasonably well for cooch grass and kaikuya. Uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't always work for dandelion if they have really deep roots and not always for cocoa, sorry, for oxalis either, depending how deep they are. Uh, that, that is putting plastic over the soil and allowing it, that it to be superheated by the sun. But you need to seal down the edges with some bricks and stones and, and make sure you do it in quite hot weather. And you also need to, this is alternative to using sprays, of course. Um, and you also need to, 
leave do it when the temperatures are hot and leave them leave it for six weeks to two months depending on the on the weather at the time so it can be a really long process and of course then you have to revitalize the soil because you've just fried it essentially um, and there are organic wheat uh, herb kill, uh, herbicides but do be careful not to use the ones that are salt based for instance that are really only meant for paving because you don't want to introduce salt into your you know, there's salt and vinegar type sprays. You don't want to introduce those into your garden beds. Anyway, you're removing your, your weeds. You can make them into weed tea. You can put them in your compost heap. But the perennials, like these three here shown, do not put them into your compost unless you're, first of all, rotting them down in a big bucket of water, for instance, until they're completely dead. And then when they're slimy and disgusting, you can add them to your compost if you don't want to take them off site. Then... If you have clay soil and you've done your little dispersion test, you can spread gypsum at the rate of one to two kilos per square metre. So I find it useful to look at my bag of gypsum and think, well, okay, that's a 10 kilo bag or a five kilo bag. And then I put a little mark with the texture, roughly where it's halfway. And I think, okay, well, that's five kilograms. And then I look and I think, well, okay, I can then figure out roughly what's a kilo, but you can also weigh it too. And then I can measure out a metre by a metre, which is one very long footstep by one very long footstep, footstep, not footstep, um, one very long step, as long as your legs can take you, uh, squared, so a metre by a metre, and then sprinkle that kilo or two over the ground, and then you get an idea of what that looks like, and then you just have to duplicate that as you go. It's not harmful if you accidentally spread a little bit more or a little bit less of gypsum. It's not a problem. <coughs> Excuse me. As mentioned before, bentonite can be harder to get, but it really is worth getting if you have sandy soil. You spread that at a greater rate. So once you clean your weeds out of your site, it's all there, ready to go. These are the, these are the additives that you need to spread over the surface and the rate that you, that you do that at, and then you're incorporating those all in to prepare your garden for planting. And this, can be used for, this method can be used for fruit trees or vegetables. You then spread 50 millimetres deep compost. So the first measurements obviously are in, in kilos, the second are in, hot, in depth. So 50 mil or two inches of compost, well rotted, definitely. And two, 20, so 25 millimetres of manure, this also needs to be well composted manure. You don't want anything that's fresh from the chicken or the sheep. And sheep, of course, um, now I haven't actually uh, itemized all the different manures here, but if you want to take quick notes, or well, you can listen to this later, um, cow manure is the slowest to release and the gentlest when it comes to levels of nitrogen. So that's why it's often recommended for vegetables. It's kind of a really ideal thing to use. And the other reason why it's so good is because of the cow's stomachs that are able to break up all the weed seeds that they're chewing. So sometimes if you take cow manure off the ground yourself, you might get some weed seeds that you picked up off the ground, but the actual cow manure won't have weed seeds in it. However, horse, donkey, sheep all have weed seeds in their manures. So they can be great, but they are best composted for that reason. And chicken, depending what you're feeding the chickens, they Actually, no, I don't think we, I'm not sure where the weed seeds come through the gut of a chicken, but that is often so strong that it is best composted before use. So look for cow, organic if possible. And if not, try to compost the other manures to get some of the, um, to get some of the weed seeds out of them first. So you're spreading all your additives over the soil, over the soil, and then you're incorporating them all to a depth of one to two spades deep. Now that's a lovely old fashioned gardening term. And that's one thing I love about gardening. It has these lovely old sayings and measurements. And um, I think that's really cute. So one spade deep is suitable for things like silver beet, leafy lettuces, onions, leeks. And the two spade deep is really for things like tomatoes that really need a bigger, a bigger depth. Now on the right hand side there, you'll see in the, and that, that's a veggie pod. It's a commercially available product with a very short, very, um, very low, very small soil depth. 
but how it manages to succeed to grow tomatoes in that depth is that it is a wicking bed. So it's, it's self-watering. The water is, there's a reservoir down the bottom of that bed. And so there's water, if, you, if you're adding water to the bed, it's constantly available to that tomato. And so that's how it, they get away with being able to grow at a deeper, uh, at a, be able to grow at a shorter depth, I should say. So you're incorporating things to that deep depth and then you should leave your soil to rest for two to four weeks before you're actually planting. So there's a good recipe for you. You should also test before, um, so I should have really put in there, test for soil contaminants, but also, uh, and after removing weeds, then test your pH. So the subsequent slide explains that, but that should really go at the beginning. Um, you, you should take, always take your soil pH before you start adding things because you then get an idea of what the existing soil is before you start. Gypsum, by the way, doesn't alter the pH of your soil, and neither does bentonite, I don't think, or I'm not 100% sure because I've, to be honest, never used bentonite. Gypsum does not, definitely does not change the, the um, pH of your soil. pH, just so that you understand what it is, it's just a measure of alkalinity or acidity of the soil, um, which is um, something that influences what kind of plants are able to grow. And also it, it, it influences what nutrients are available and you can get little charts online that that indicate which nutrients are available at which which ph levels and certain vegetables only like particular um, ph levels so for instance if uh, anything lower than seven and you can see that little card on the right hand side there the colors and seven is green so six and a half six you don't want to go too much lower than that but that is all delegated as acidic and tomatoes, capsicum and eggplants really like acidic soil, slightly higher than seven. So again, you're not really wanting to go much higher or much lower. And as you can see there, most vegetables grow between six to 7.5, but beans, peas, onions, and garlic grow at a, a slightly more alkaline, a higher pH than seven. So it's really useful to, to find that out before you have to make any changes to your garden soil beyond what I've just given you on the slide before. Now, this little pH tester kit here is just as good as anything. And I don't really believe that the meters, we were, we were always taught at Burnley that the meters, unless they're, high, unless they're very expensive, are not usually that accurate. And the pH tester kits using a little bit of white powder sorry, blue dye to mix in with your soil sample taken as described in the um, under, underneath, underneath the mulch in your, soil, in your garden. And then you, you mix, you moisten the soil with the blue dye liquid, and then you puff some of the white powder over the top, which is barium sulfate apparently. And then you wait a minute or two and you examine it in good light, uh, natural light as it says on the card there, not fluorescent light because it alters the way the colors look. And then you'll be able to determine what um, pH your soil is. That's quite fun, actually. It's a good activity to do with kids as well. Lauren, um, yes, Jerry's just interested to know whether how what frequency you should check your veggie garden. Should you, should you do it every year? Oh, every every time you replant. So let me just go back to that slide. Oh, that's right. This I think this was covered. Beg your pardon. So, so, yeah, is my face covering that last line, replenish your soil? Uh, no, we can see that. Oh, okay, 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 because I couldn't see it. Okay, so yes, you should replenish your soil each season. So the main planting times for vegetables are usually planting in spring for, for spring and summer harvest or planting in autumn for winter and spring harvest. So... That's your two main planting times. You're lucky if you can squeeze in any more than that in Victoria. You might only plant, you might only be a summer planter and many people only plant in summer and run their tomatoes through and things like that. And so they rest their garden in winter. But every time you plant, so when I say each season, it's a bit misleading because that makes it sound like it's every winter, spring, summer, autumn. In fact, it's every planting season. So that's another one of those little funny gardening terminologies that I didn't realise wasn't clear in the English language because it's kind of in gardening language. So apologies for that. 
So re replenish your soil every time you plant, and that also includes pH testing. <clears throat> so before you're ready to plant any crop, you test your pH and go through that whole replenishment thing. And what I haven't included there, but it's included in the pH tester kit, is what you do if you find out your soil is too acidic or too alkaline. And one other really important point to note which is not mentioned in the, or it didn't used to be mentioned in the pH tester kit. And it took myself and a lot of other professional gardeners and bully nursery quite a lot to figure out was why soil with lots of, a soil mix from bully nursery that had a high degree of manures in it. So lots of organic matter. So it should have been measuring acidic and it kept showing repeatedly that it was quite alkaline, even up to eight, crazy. And what we finally found out was that these particular pH tester kits um, will give a false alkaline reading when there's undecomposed organic matter in the soil. So another reason why it's really good to check before you um, add your manure and compost to your soil. But if you find out your soil is too acidic or too alkaline, bear in mind that adding compost and manure will raise the acidity slightly. So you can do another little test afterwards, but if you have undecomposed organic matter, you will get a false reading. So if you, if you measure your soil before you add anything and it's seven, and then you add organic matter and it goes up to eight, well, that's a false reading. I hope that makes sense. So it should be lowering in, in numerical value and it should be becoming more acidic. So you either add lime or garden lime or sulfur and the instructions for that are in your pH tester kits. So this is just a bit of an overview of the different types of compost. And there's so many different ways of composting and handling your waste. And of course, uh, your compostable waste out of each household is anywhere between 30 to 50% of what is often thrown out. So it's a fantastic resource or re that you don't want to waste. Um, so one way of doing it is a, a worm farm. So they can be a rectangular system or a rectangular plastic boxes laid on top of each other or circular. And I think the circular ones are often called worm cafe, but that's really just a brand. They might even have rectangular ones as well. So the instructions are all within those and worm farms need to be kept quite cool. So that is suitable for people that don't have any ground to compost on, uh, so people in apartments, but they do need to be kept cool. So if you don't have a, cool, a shady spot, then worm farms are not going to be suitable for you unless you can find somewhere to shade them and keep them cool, otherwise they'll die in summer. So then we've got the distinction between cold, which is also slow compost, or hot, which is also a very fast way to compost. So, and all of these, uh, all of these points underneath kind of fit into those two systems but cold or slow is how a lot of people compost and I compost in Melbourne like that although I do have a worm farm as well so what that means is you're just kind of adding things as you go and you you top them up you top it up all the time you try to keep it you do try to keep a balance though between green which is also known as wet or brown which is also known as dry so Brown could be anything from dry leaves or straw from your chickens' nesting boxes or shredded paper from home offices. And I'm sure many of us have some shredded paper these days from our home offices with everyone working from home or most people. Uh, so green can be anything from grass clippings, but be sure not to put them in in big clumps because they can become quite, the mould that they create can be quite toxic to breathe in. So always incorporate things. Kitchen scraps are designated as, um, as green, even though they can be multicoloured. And garden waste, well, garden waste can be dry leaves, of course, but if it's prunings that are, are tip prunings or lighter, lighter things, then, um, then that's more um, what you're looking at with green. So you're trying to keep a balance of those. So um, you don't want too much green or too much brown. Con uh, even moisture is really, really important. So if you're putting anything dry into your bin, you're, don't, don't let me make you think that you don't moisten that. Anything you put in that's dry, you hose at the same time. So having your compost near a tap is really handy or having a hose running out to that so that you can be watering as you add things. You don't want to at any stage put in layers of anything more than that 
that's dry. So you put in that much, you water it, you toss it around, make sure it's wet. Then you add a bit more, a bit more, and you, you're never putting too much in at a time um, so that you don't get any dry layers because worms are not able to move up and down within that. And also you'll get patches of composting that's not happening in, um, you, you need moisture for true composting to happen. So aerating a bin, whatever method you use. And so this is an open bin uh, at my cousin's house in Sydney and he throws his compost in, which is uh, freshly thrown out each day, I should say, because otherwise he'd be putting out mouldy things and the chickens would be getting into that. Then he lets his chickens rummage through and find what they want and they do a bit of turning over for him. And he also uses the heat from his compost areas, compost bays, and he has two compost bays side by side. And so um, and that's, a, that's an important point. No matter what you have, or worm farms, I suppose, are the only systems where you can be continuously composting. But in my, and some compost bins do allow you to harvest from the bottom and continue putting in at the top. But in most cases, you're going to have a two bin system. So it is worth researching all of these and finding out um, what's going to work for your particular space. Uh, so he also uses the heat from his compost bays to put trays of seedlings on to help get some bottom heat so they germinate more quickly. Another really important point is to put some um, four, less than four centimetre square mesh wire underneath your bins because rats and mice are just such a problem in urban gardens. And I know it was always a continuous, um, a continuous um, not quite cat and mouse, mouse, mouse and human chase in my garden with regard to rats and mice, keeping them out of the compost. And it's not a reason not to compost, but just be aware that wherever you have compost, you'll, you will get mice and rats. So, And if, if you put that much compost in your bin and the next day it's gone down to that, it has not composted overnight, most usually, unless you've got a huge amount of grass clippings and leaves in that can be fluffy and go down quickly. But mostly when you put in a lot at once and it goes down quickly, it means that if it's, if it's kitchen scraps, you've had mice or rats eat, go in and eat things. So that can be quite a problem. Uh, there's uh, a lot Karen, to... Yeah, sorry. Oh, mm -hmm. Sorry. I'm just yes. jumping in with Lydia's question. Yes. She's got bugs, flies and ants in her compost bin. Is that okay or is there something not quite right? So ants are always an indicator of dry conditions. And so ants mean you need to keep watering. And that means the same with your potted plants too. If you've got ants in your potted plants, try to soak them in a bucket of water overnight and discourage the ants because ants really don't like being flooded out like that, which is why you'll often see ants, I know up in the country up here, we see ants um, protecting the tops of their little houses or their underground houses just before, and we know it's going to rain soon. And, you know, the, the, the ants are really good predictors of imminent rain. So, yeah, ants mean too dry. You know, if, if you remember that ants don't like being flooded out with rain, then you'll remember that ants mean it's too dry. So um, little flies don't always mean a problem. There can be vinegar flies. There can be lots of different things. Uh, if they're house flies or blow flies, you might have put animal products into your compost. You really don't. I mean, this is a very small slide on a big topic. Composting is its own complete class. So I do encourage you to look up the My Smart Garden notes. I'm sure there would have been more than one class on composting over the years. It's more than I can cover in one slide and without being able to you know, run out of time to cover everything else. But um, you can also, as a method of keeping flies out of the top, you, oh, sorry, sorry, I should have said no animal products, but as another method, you can use old potting mix. So potting mix that's more than three years old that you've had to change over. Um, you can keep it at the side of your compost bin. You can also keep dry leaves there. And then as you add any kitchen waste, <coughs> which tends to attract those little flies, you can sprinkle a little layer of, of uh, potting mix or uh, dry leaves to help stop the flies getting in there. Is that enough while we um, move on? Is that okay? But yeah, I'd encourage you to look into composting a whole lot more than what I've got. That's the most basic introduction. Um, so this is what some of you may have, which is a bit of a balcony garden. Um, this, is, this lady's growing lemon myrtle and pejoas and sage and and some other herbs and chives. And you can see she's done underplanting in the troughs and things. So, and this is in Richmond. Uh, so I suppose what I wanted to say on this slide is 
make sure that you, it was really just an interesting slide, but um, it's an interesting little garden to do, but you need to think about how much time you've got and spending a small amount of time every day, a bit like a lot of other practices. So for people that want to get good at their drawing or their sketching a little bit each day is good. For aspiring writers, a bit each day is good. I'm a yoga devotee and I know that if I miss some yoga every day, uh, it's not so great the next day. So yeah, gardening is like that. And one of the, it's not just because you get better at it. It's also because your garden really needs you every day. And spending that little bit of time regularly means that you notice problems before they become an issue. So that's more, that's more the reason to be honest. And um, even when you think there's not much to do, you'll find that there's, there's more than you realize and you'll notice insects, you'll notice birds and you notice the interactions that are happening in your garden. So I, I really recommend that if you can make the time to do it at a certain time each day, it could be because you need to hand water, whatever it is, but spend time every day. Um, I'm, ex I'm expecting that you don't have a vast amount of experience. And so down further and later on in the presentation, we've got a selection of easy peasy vegetables. Excuse our funny little pun. Uh, and I would really suggest that you avoid the more difficult, so I haven't listed all those here because I wouldn't fit on the slide, but you've got a slide with them later. But um, if you can try and avoid the more difficult or higher maintenance vegetables, because if you're not used to the amount of work it ta they take, then um, for various reasons, I've listed those ones there. And you might have great success growing them, but if, um, if you're a raw beginner, then I would suggest avoiding those for a start. Uh, space is a really big consideration. And I know that Jerry at the beginning was talking about lack of space. So be aware and, and seed catalogs and, and online seed sellers don't always distinguish between the, the, the sizes of something. And I remember as a newbie gardener or, a, well, not so much newbie, but I'd, um, I was a lot younger gardener, let's say, and I innocently bought some peas called Telephone, and this is about 30 years ago. And uh, I should have, shouldn't have been surprised that they grew to the height of a telephone pole. <laughs> Not really, but they, yeah, they grow really, really high. And so then I hunted around and found a semi-dwarf variety, which grew for 30 odd years. And I've been growing it up here as well. Grew it in Melbourne for that long, called Delta Louise snow peas. Lovely, semi-dwarf. There's lots of really interesting heirloom varieties out there and it only grows to 1.2 metres. So, so look for things that are the right size for your garden. And I haven't mentioned here, but I'm going to make a point in a minute about tomato sizes. Um, so pumpkins and zucchinis, there are bush varieties as well as trailing. So choose your varieties really carefully. And look, with pumpkins, you'll get smaller pumpkins. You won't get the great big pumpkins with the bushes, but you'll have something that won't take over your garden. You can try and trade them up trees as well or fence lines. But um, yeah, if you try and choose things that are appropriate to your garden size, it will help you a lot. And the other really important thing is, uh, it's, and these are different herbs that, uh, sorry, different terms that get bandied around, but repeat harvest means you can keep harvesting from something. So repeat harvest would be something like celery where you're just taking stem by stem or flat leaf parsley or leafy lettuces, uh, cut and come again. Oh, that could be cut and come again as well, I suppose. So they're, they're kind of inter, inter, interlaid. Um, oh, sorry, repeat harvest is more long-term long, long -term harvest, such as, uh, I beg your pardon, I'm getting a bit muddled up there. So there are tomatoes that are indeterminate or there's others that are determinant, meaning that they, determinate means that they finish at a certain, you don't have to remember all this, or this is a bit more complex gardening, but. There's a tom there are tomatoes that if you read the description, it says bear over a long time, go for those ones if they're the right size for your garden. And then there's others that are quick bearing, but only um, bear, but bear quite quickly, but then don't continue to bear. So just bear in mind, just, you know, research what you're going to grow. Um, so things, this is why things like this, the veggies I've mentioned here are great for small spaces, things like kale and bok choy, because you can harvest these from the out, so always harvest from the outside first, and we mentioned that in a harvest slide later, but you'll get better value from these because they, um, you're not just waiting for one thing to grow and then harvesting it. And so space-wise too, I, I should have mentioned this, but ran out of room, but I'll just talk about it in that there's, 
uh, the, as I was mentioning with the tomatoes, look for tomatoes that are smaller. So there's a whole range of tomatoes called dwarf tomatoes, and it's a special project uh, um, run by volunteers called the Dwarf Tomato Project. And so I'd encourage you to have a look at that because they specifically grow tasty, interesting, modern heirlooms. And it's a whole lot of expressions there that I won't go into right now, unless you really want me to. And they only grow, some of them only grow to 50 or 60 centimetres high. So they're, they're really useful in small space gardening and in raised beds where you don't want something to be two metres high above the height of your 600 millimetre raised bed. And just to also go over the fact that herbs, leafy lettuces and berries have the highest carbon footprint. So they're always best to consider if you're trying to grow your own food for environmental reasons, or you want to take that into account. Uh, consider, of course, what you like to eat and cook. I mean, that makes sense to me, but it's funny. I've often heard of people growing stacks of something that they don't even like, which seems such an odd thing to do. And it's really good to look up in your seed catalogues and your online seed sellers, the time to harvest. And that means how long it's going to be before you can start harvesting. So time to harvest means how long it's going to be, how long you can expect. and Sometimes they'll give you this from the point of view of seedlings and sometimes they'll give you this from seed. So um, from seed to seedling, planting out your seedling is usually four to six weeks. So you can add, uh, if you're buying a seedling, I should say, you can probably subtract a month and a half off the time to harvest. It's a very variable thing because it depends on your garden, your microclimate and how much heat you've got. And it also depends on the fertility of your soil, how well you water, and the season that year. So there's so many variables. But if you're looking for tomatoes, for instance, to harvest and you've only got a really small space, you don't want to be waiting. You don't want to get varieties that are going to take 80 days to harvest, for instance. You want some that are going to be 65, for instance. So yeah, look carefully when you're choosing your varieties, if, if you can find them available. And write, keep a garden journal is something I haven't put in here, but that's probably worthwhile doing too. Now, this is a little bit about crop rotation as planned, as promised. And so this shows a small garden that's been divided up into beds so that um, individual crops can be grown. So there's corn in one area, there's tomatoes in another, there's eggplants in another, cucubits or zucchini in another. So you've got areas where you, you know what has been grown in one area and the next year you can definitely grow something different. So crop rotation, it's, it's part of organic gardening and you don't have to do it, but what it does is helps to avoid pests and diseases building up in the soil. And so you might not do it, you might and you might get away with it for a long time, but then suddenly you'll get a pest or disease. And when you look up what it is and you look up the organic um, management of that pest or disease, you'll find that the management is to avoid growing that plant or that plant family in that soil for three years. And so three, that's why crop rotations start with three and they can be, they're more sophisticated going up to six, but three is a bare minimum. So if you're able to plant three very different types of plant families in a particular garden bed over each season, then you're going to, um, or over a three, well, for instance, and again, now you're going to have this, the slight issue of garden seasons versus years. So tomatoes and Solanaceae, so Solanaceae, uh, all the night, are also, also called the nightshade family. And that is tomatoes, eggplants, capsicum, chilies. So all of those plants are in the same family. So they should not be planted in the same bed for three years. So if you're planting twice a year, you're only going to be planting tomatoes or those, those are all warm climate plants. So you won't be planting those again in winter anyway, but it does add a slight extra layer of confusion in when you're if you're planting twice a year so the main thing you have to find out or learn is how plants fit into certain families because when you look up 
crop rotation systems, you'll see that they might say, uh, you know, um, tomato family, they'll, they'll group things in families. And so it might be um, brassicas. Now that can be confusing too, because most brassicas are leafy greens. So that's broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, bok choy. However, there are also brassicas that are um, root vegetables. So that can be a little confusing, but generally leafy greens are different to root vegetables, are different to tomato family. So uh, look through, well, first of all, you've got to figure out, do you only have three definite areas you could distinguish between if you're going to practice good crop rotation? and or correct crop rotation and so if you only have space for three beds well then you're going to have to follow a three bed system so then you just google that and you follow that system as best you can and then if you find oh dear i need to grow more tomatoes and i can't fit them into my crop rotation system that's when you look at things like pots to give you extra space for growing tomatoes or you can also look at grow bags so that's how you get around that you you don't grow tomatoes in that garden bed for another three years, you grow, you grow something else. And so if you don't have enough space in, in the other beds, then you, you grow them in a different way. You grow them in a different manner, but not in your soil because potting mix, uh, and you can't grow them in potting mix, in the same potting mix year after year either. Well, not if you want to avoid diseases as much as possible. And then you, yeah, so then the other option, which is where what I think Jerry's question at the very beginning before everyone started, before we started recording, was, well, what do you do if you don't have an, or somebody did ask the question, what do you do if you don't have room for crop rotation? And now I have to make a confession that I am not a very good crop rotator. I do try, but especially my garden in Melbourne, it's very higgledy-piggledy and mixed. And that was that first, you know, one of the first photos you saw. And so I go for a really haphazard kind of, crop protection which is that I mix beneficial plants that are going to attract beneficial insects and they've got lots of scent to them like the like the fever few that you saw the little white daisy pictures of the in, daisy flowers of in the picture and so to me they help stop um, pest insects zoning in um, it doesn't stop build-ups in the soil and so I did have problems with celery whereby I had to stop growing celery in that whole bit, in that whole patch because I had a, um, a, a leaf spot that it was just impossible to get rid of without stopping celery growing at all in the garden. So, um, and the other thing I do is um, some, some mustard plants can be eaten as a green veggie or grown for their seed to make mustards, but they can also be used as a soil fumigant for certain pests and diseases. So you can look up some of those things. It, this is a very big topic as well. Uh, a green manure crop, or, so mustards can be used as part of a green manure crop, but you can also use other kinds of, so green manure crop can improve soil is a, a very much of an understatement. It can not only improve soil, but it can be used to fumigate soil, improve soil. Um, it's, it's worth looking into that. So, so I suppose I'm using not a very strict companion planting system, but I'm using a very loose companion planting system. And I mostly get success with that. And I just try to avoid growing really problematic things like tomatoes in the same spot every year. And if I notice a disease, like in my celery, I, I, take, a bit, I take action. But the problem with my sort of garden is that it will, I, I rely on self-seeding quite a lot. And so things will go where they go and I don't always move them around and so yeah look it, do, it does work I've had really good productivity from my garden in Melbourne um, it's just a different way of doing things but I would be remiss if I didn't explain to you that crop rotation is an ideal way of avoiding um, a pests and diseases. Lee I'm thinking that you might like a break at this time. Yes, uh, well, maybe, and you may wish to have a quick break, but perhaps we could, first, mm. we could first um, just quickly clarify for Danielle. Uh, I think this is relating to possibly the green manure crop because she's saying she heard rotating tomato soil next oh, season yes. growing plants like snow peas and beans. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. be? So yeah. uh, growing legumes, so legumes are another plant group. So that includes peas, snow peas, um, that also includes broad beans, climbing beans, bush beans. 
they do return nitrogen to the soil. That is not just what tomatoes need. So tomatoes need a lot more complex uh, nutrients than just um, nitrogen. Not that they don't need nitrogen, um, but they they need um, phos uh, potassium for uh, and phosphorus for good stem and, and fruit and root growth. But the, the plants that need heaps and heaps of nitrogen are the leafy greens and celery. And so there's a really complex six bed system, which you, I can't seem to find online anymore, but it was Peter Kundal's system that he used at the Hobart Botanic Gardens. And his system grew legumes before leafy greens. So everything, uh, and then after the leafy greens, which are hungry and took a lot of nutrients out, then he would plant root veggies. So which generally, um, do better when the soil is a bit deficient. So uh, there, there's a bit of a old community, old community gardener, or el I should say, elderly community gardener um, thing that was happening at the community garden I used to be part of in Moreland, where people only had a really limited space. So they would grow tomatoes, and then they'd alternate with broad beans in winter. And yes, that did put something into the soil, but because they grew tomatoes every summer that whole garden still is filled with a disease called verticillium wilt. And it doesn't kill the tomatoes, but it makes them really weak. And uh, there's, I mean, that's where I, I was a co-author on a, on a, um, a co, the three of us wrote a book on tomatoes, tomato growing in Australia on heirloom tomatoes. And that's where I got my photo of verticillium wilt was from the community garden because I knew that they, that we had it there. And so um, I can tell you without a doubt that if you keep growing, tomatoes are one of the most disease-ridden things ever. When I was researching for that book, I got some information from Queensland um, Agricultural Department or something on tomato diseases. I was doing all the research, didn't want to use the non-organic, didn't want to recommend the non-organic solutions, but wanted to read what was on offer about the diseases and pests. And they started off with congratulations, you've chose to grow the, the crop with the most pests and diseases of anything in agriculture. So tomatoes have a lot of pests and diseases and it really is worth trying to do the right thing. And there are also, if you look them up, tomatoes, even heirlooms, this is why some people grow hy uh, F1 hybrids because they are more disease resistant, but they, you cannot save the seed of those unless they've been dehybridized. So um, this is a bit complex, but um, so you can, if you're concerned about pests and diseases, you can grow F1 hybrids, but you can't, and they're labeled on the seed packet, but you can't save the seeds. But there are heirloom seed tomatoes that are disease resistant to particular diseases, but the best ploy is to not grow tomatoes or anything related to that in, in the same soil you know, if, if, you grow in the, if you grow them this summer, you're not going to be planting them for another three years. Brilliant. Good place to maybe take a quick break. So everyone jump off and grab a snack or a cup of tea. And um, shall we reconvene at about um, just after 10 past, maybe about 12 past, give you six, five or yeah, seven that's minutes. Fine. And mm -hmm. then we'll have plenty of time to to do the second half. And feel free to type questions in yeah. while we're stretching. Yes, yes. If you've got that question that's tip of your mind, use this little break to, to drop it in there. Um, we'll don't see feel, you all back. I was just going to say, don't feel bad, everybody, because um, I taught a, I taught a um, diploma. I taught at TAFE for a little while, a diploma um, of, of uh, a subject in sustainable landscape design and I taught the edible garden section and I it was just really hard to teach crop rotation and we gave it I gave it really detailed notes but it just gets quite confusing so don't feel bad just try and choose a really simple system and just stick with that and see how you go but it's just don't grow the same thing in the same soil if you can avoid it good tip all right see you all back soon I'll leave my screen open Lee I'm not going to be here I'm just going to stretch yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Unless you want to stop, I don't know if you want to stop the recording. I'm not going to make any noise anyway. Actually, I'll make I'll stop the recording. Okay, and then that's I'll sensible. Make sure I remember to start it again. <laughs> I'll try and remind you. <laughs> yes, is it good? Sorry, oh, I'm sorry. just going to catch. I'm yeah. going to catch this question. So because I oh, think it's a good again. one. Yep, go on. So I've got some money, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I want to buy a good general gardening book. What would you suggest for? for edible gardening just 
just general, like, you know, composting, planting. Mm -hmm. I I am Um, in an apartment, um, so I probably am small gardening type, mm -hmm. but I just want to have a good, like I've got Stephanie Alexander's cookbook, which I Mm -hmm. use as my Bible, you know, when I'm cooking. Mm -hmm. I just want a good gardening book that, um, that will take me through the years. I just have to jump away from the screen. No, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> I have to find um, a couple of, well, I'm going to answer your question in part. Mm-hmm. So depends how much money you won. This is yep. my desert island book, although, of course, on a yep. desert island, how can you grow your veggies? But, you know, <laughs> yep. this is probably my favourite. Now, it's not doesn't teach you about composting. So right. it's, I don't think there's one book that teaches everything, but I will mention yeah, one exactly. that might teach everything. Uh, so the Seed Savers Handbook by Michelle and Jude in Australian, you'd say Fanton in French, mm-hmm. Fanton. But yep. this is just the best book. I, I've given it to so many people um, because it, it really takes you through. Uh, it's, it's got so much packed into a small, reasonably priced book. The back has charts on seed viability, right. which is really essential when you're labelling seed when you're keeping them. So yep. it's for, for when you're a little bit more advanced, but mm-hmm. it's it just, I just used to have it beside my bed and read it every single night uh, until I learned a lot of things, really, truly. Yep. But it introduces you. It's got the basics like pumpkin. Yep, right. But then, except that seed saving a pumpkin is not basic. So it takes you through that. Yep. And then it's got unusual things like OCA, which is OC, oh, hang on, sorry, OCA, yep. which is a um, South, South American vegetable, but really popular in New Zealand, but it's a really mm-hmm. small tuber. So it's got all sorts of stuff and some herbs like garlic chives, ginger, you know, ginger that's a bit difficult to grow in Melbourne, but it's still included because it's New South Wales people. Yeah, right. Um, so there's just so much good information in there. And, and there's also information about, planting too so um but it's a really good uh that's probably one of my um most given and most loved books yep thank you Um, another thing you could do to get really good information over time sorry about the glare is to subscribe to organic gardener now my disclaimer is that i am one of the writers for organic gardener but it really is at a very good level it's all organic and i can tell you they make sure we write really accurately um there's you know things have to be available that mm-hmm. it's the the editors are really fussy um so that is a very good book and and we've been given the um kind of directive in the last year since um since covid's really been a problem to make sure that i mean every little small gardening term we have to explain very well because we're constantly being reminded that there's so many new gardeners Mm -hmm. so with nothing's taken for granted and um so it's labeled abc although it's not particularly owned by the abc anymore but it's got a auspice by the abc but there's everything from chooks to um you know clean um organic house cleaning but the articles are inspiring and um, it, they are very, very accurate. Believe me, we work hard on that magazine. So that's also a good one. Thank you. Um, what's another one? Uh, that's fine. I don't want to take over the... Okay, yeah. No, yeah, and, and also um, Justin Calvary from, from Series. Now, he's written a, a, quite a big book called The Urban Farmer. Now, I've bought it but I'm embarrassed to say I haven't really read it a lot mainly because it covers things that I kind of know or I just haven't had time to read it at all but okay. also go into go into a good bookshop and like um where can I ask what are you near Brunswick or um yeah, Pauline I mean Footscray. Or Footscray yep okay um so you're closer to series so series nursery that Bushfield nursery when it yep. uh, I'm not even sure if they're open at the moment. But if you can go to there, they sell a really big variety of books. And out of all the nurseries I know, they probably sell the most books. Mm -hmm. And they've got great staff, uh, really knowledgeable. And um, I'm shaking my head, but I should be be doing this. (laughs) Really knowledgeable people and very helpful. And so I would have a good browse through their books, but also Mm. just say to them, look, I've been recommended the Seed Savers Handbook. I'd be surprised if they didn't sell it, but if not, you can buy it online yep. from, from the Seed Thank Savers. You. And um, 
yeah, I would go there and see, and of course, just some coveries from series. So um, and have a look at his book and see whether that's going to be um, more than you want. Um, yep. And otherwise, see what else they've got, because there's probably yep. some new books that have come out. So hmm. yep. thank you. You're welcome. Okay, are we, uh, we're recording, aren't we, Lee? So we can jump, yep, continue let's on. carry on. There is a question about uh, growing tropical plants like okra, vegetable, melon, long beans. I don't know whether you might cover that a bit later or want to just quickly. Um, that's from I, might cover it in, I might cover it in seed saving. We've got a seed, okay. oh, sorry, seed yep. growing and seed. We'll keep going because it's not a really yep. basic question. So we'll try yep. and cover things that are going to be good for. Um, basic, uh, for, yep. Yeah, so it's frozen again. I'll just, yeah, come on. I might have to reset this, sorry. No, it's, I think it's when it sits for a long time. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'll just make sure that I, yeah, okay. So these are, this is some other ideas, uh, other ways you can grow or take advantage of every space you've got. So, Vertical gardening doesn't have to be a wall garden. You can grow up a tripod and the one on the right hand side you see is handmade with uh, string and bamboo cane. So really beautiful and a bit of fun to make. Uh, so you can also grow, uh, that's, that's um, a little tripod and you can also grow up arches. And so you can buy those. They're not often that expensive and arches are quite good for growing um, some berries over or you can grow some of your climbing beans over things like that. And we've had fun in the past with, um, with customers with raised beds and then they've, um, we had raised beds that were close enough together and they just put some lovely bamboo across like this and tied them at the top and then twined their beans up those. So you can find lots of different ways to grow, you know, across spaces. Uh, if you're growing up a fence line, that can mean soil contamination if the fence line's been painted. So or the fence has been painted at some stage. So again, you might want to refer to the VeggieSafe program. Now, those pots on the left, um, this slight, slight disclaimer, there's some we stock, but we stock those because they've got a really good soil depth. And I've done a lot of mucking around with uh, with wall gardens of different types, and they're either very expensive or they don't hold moisture very well and these have got a little self-watering reservoir in the bottom of them so they're quite mm. good so that's a way and they just clip onto a fence or uh, onto a little hook so that's another thing to consider and so if you're going to use a wall garden or any kind of wall garden just consider that you're better to grow them in uh, in a, not in the most exposed spot you have because they can dry out very very quickly and that that's the same with hanging baskets too hanging baskets grow out uh, dry out very very quickly and so um, you need to consider that that's not so much vertical but sort of up in the air gardening but um, I haven't even mentioned those but yeah they uh, using terracotta and tub potting mix which is a potting mix that has a lot of water saving uh, materials in it that can be a way to help retain moisture in hanging baskets. Raised beds are almost always the way beginner gardeners grow now. I mean, a few people experiment with hanging baskets or, or wall gardens, but or little pots and walls, but uh, these, these raised beds have become synonymous with vegetable growing. And for anyone who's a bit older, like myself, you know that this wasn't always the way that vegetables were grown. And so soil, good soil was hard won and it was a lot, it was a lot of work. So raised beds, of course, are really good, although these are the, the, low, the bottom ones are a little bit higher. The, the, the ones in the um, top picture, of course, are not that high. But you can, of course, have your raised beds built to a height, which is really good if you have, bad, have a bad back or you just have less, less ability, generally physical ability. So they're brilliant in that situation. And it means that, um, you know, gardening can become very equalised in that way. So everyone has access to it. They do have very, very good drainage. So that, that is a good thing that can result in them sometimes uh, losing too much moisture. So, you know, that's a, a, a win and a, or, you know, a plus and a minus. Um, because you have often quite good soil depth and that this refers back to the one to two soil depths we spoke about earlier. So if you're able to have a brand new garden bed with brand new um, 
good quality vegetable growing mix from a reputable nursery and you plonk that in there and you've got two spades deep of that, your vegetables just thrive. They go crazy. So you're going to get really, get really good results. They can be timber, galvanised metal, and so you can buy you can buy galvanised metal. You can buy timber beds ready made. There's uh, companies such as there's a company called Modbox that makes those, and they are wicking or not wicking, I believe. I think they can be non wicking as well. The galvanised metal beds are either round or they tend to be kind of um, rectangular slash oval, what's that rectangular with curved edges, and they can be bought ready made from nurseries. The plastic ones are things like, uh, I forget the name of the biofilter product, but it's a brand, uh, a company called Biofilter and also VeggiePod that we saw earlier in that other, in, the, in an earlier picture. So you can buy ready made beds that are plastic and there's other ones too. There's, there's many, many other. In fact, I think a recent Organic Gardener, oh, sorry, it's this month's Organic Gardener article I've, um, um, well, it was myself and one of the editors wrote, but I think I got attributed it to. But yeah, that, he listed a whole lot of, uh, it's coming up in this this new organic gardener. There's a whole point about instant raised beds and where to buy them and um, what brands are out there. Um, if you do have contaminated soil, then a raised bed is going to be a necessity because you might have soil that is just way too toxic to grow vegetables in and you're not going to have any health benefits or you're going, to, you're going to make yourself ill from growing, if, especially if you have high lead levels. So that's when a raised bed is absolutely perfect. Another reason that I didn't list there actually is if you've got uh, tree roots of an adjoining, it might not even be your tree, it might be a neighbour's tree. And so you just can't grow in the ground because the tree roots suck all the moisture out. Now, remember that tree roots will come up even into, I've got raised beds here, but we've got big gum trees and they reach quite a long distance and every six months I have to dig these roots out and if we'd realized that when my parents were setting them up 20 odd years ago we would have lined them with a geotextile fabric so uh, consider doing that if you have adjoining trees in the vicinity and then you can keep those tree roots out so that's another really good reason for using galvanized beds and also if your soil is just very poor and you're not able to do much with it or you, you feel that you're not capable of improving it or you think it's going to take too long. So this now comes a little bit of a conundrum as well. So larger beds are generally best filled with a vegetable soil. So you treat them as if they were in the ground at the ground themselves. Whereas smaller beds such as veggie pods, the, the plastic one I was talking about before, they say that they that they're designed to be used with potting mix. So you don't fill those with vegetable soil. You use or vegetable soil mix, you use a, a potting mix. And that then has to be changed every three years because potting mix by its very nature will break down over that period of time and become too clogged. And so what you'll get over time is the larger, coarser particles rising to the surface of the potting mix. And down the bottom, you'll find smaller, sandier particles that tend to hold moisture more. And so what you'll have is the roots of your plants getting really wet and the tops being really dry. So it is a bit wasteful uh, dealing with removing potting mix all the, every three years. And if you've got a lot of plants in pots, it can be a bit of an issue. And I've experimented a lot myself with trying to add more nutrients in to try and make potting mix last longer, but they end up, it ends up becoming quite clogged. And in the end, you do have to dispense with it and get fresh potting mix, potting mix to get better results. And you'll also have to, even, you, even in the intervening time between first planting vegetables and potting mix and three years later when you're changing it over, you have to add fertiliser every, um, every season that you're planting. So whether that's twice a year or, or once a year. But you can use that, uh, like I mentioned in the compost section, you can use that leftover potting mix for um, sprinkling through your compost as an extra layer and to help keep flies out of the top. So it does have a use. Uh, no dig gardens are another whole form of raised beds that we won't go into now, but uh, you, I'm trying to remember the name of the woman, Esther Dean, beg your pardon, Esther Dean. So she is a bit of an institution at the time and she's written some kind of hilariously dated books, but really good information on, um, you'll understand what I mean when you read them, but um, they, um, yeah, very, very good gardens, very, very, very interesting 
way of managing raising gardens and not dig, not having to dig, <clears throat> but they do dry out really badly. So if you don't, if you live in a dry area or you're going through drought conditions, they're not suitable. So just such an introducer to these really is all I'm able to do. And wicking beds, some people do inadvertently call them wicked beds, meaning that they're, you know, really cool, but they actually are wicking beds. And the wicking is the moisture coming up from the bottom and being drawn up through the soil, which has to have good level of good levels of organic matter for that to work. And because they're a sealed system with the water at the bottom, the water goes down, it goes into the bottom and it gradually evaporates from the top, but less will evaporate if you're mulching. You can reduce your water use or your, or your frequency of watering by half. So if you're watering your garden once a week, twice a week, you'll only have to water it once a week with a wicking bed. But of course, that's going to change with the seasons. So container gardens. Uh, Sorry, quick kind of, question uh, before yes. we move on. What was the what was the barrier that you said that you could use? To oh stop yes, roots? maybe maybe I'll just type that in because yep. then people have got that written. So not root barrier, no. It's geo textile fabric. So I'm a bad typist, so you just have to bear with me. It's available by the meter. It's a fluffy kind of in inverted commas fabric. It's not a fabric. They also put it underneath roads to um, give uh, give strength to the road structure. You just get it at Bunnings or something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. Hardware shop. Yeah, but that's, that's what it's called. So container gardens are similar. They, of course, being smaller, definitely need potting mix. So you can use large pots. You can use recycled containers such as old um, old olive oil tins or all sorts of really funky things off good old not very exciting looking but really really useful foam fruit boxes and I must admit to a, a slight fondness for these because they're just so useful and I mean foam fruit boxes you can use empty as a mini greenhouse if you have one about yay deep like 30 centimeters deep or even deeper and in that case, you want to punch a couple of little holes in the bottom if they don't have them to allow for drainage of your water. And you simply put a piece of plastic, clear plastic or glide rope or whatever you've got over the top and you can grow seedlings in there, either straight into the foam fruit box with um, potting mix and then a bit of seed raising mix on top or in little punnets or pots. So you can use it as a propagating area. Or I like to also always have a foam fruit box full of just general potting mix hanging around. And if I get a little cutting that I don't, you know, not something that I want to take a whole lot of cuttings of, but just one little piece that I think, oh, I don't want to waste that. Then you poke that into your foam fruit box of potting mix. And if it's an easily grown plant, you'll find that you'll come back later and it will be grow with any luck, it'll be growing. So <clears throat> it's a handy thing to have just for every, just for random cuttings that you, that take your fancy. And of course, they're great for growing strawberries. They're good for growing turmeric, things that are shallow rooted because they, they're only about um, 30, you know, usually about 30 centimetres high. So you can make pots into wicking beds. And I don't have any photos of those here, but people have used 20 litre detergent containers and things like that, things that haven't had anything toxic in them. And then you can make those with instructions, which you'll find online into wicking beds. Uh, pots give really good warmth to growing and this is a bit of a reference to people wanting to grow unusual warm climate plants so I struggled for years to get turmeric to I could get it to grow but I couldn't get it uh, leafy growth but I couldn't get it to form rhizomes that I could harvest and another gardener Kat Lavers her parents gardening friend her parents figured out that black plastic pots were actually excellent for turmeric and even though it's a shade loving plant Growing it in the sun in Melbourne was better because it got the heat that it needed to form the rhizomes. So that, that's the sort of experimentation and just talking to other people and finding out what they're doing to um, get tricks for growing warm climate plants like that. Uh, with the seed sowing with warm climate plants, I will mention that when I get to seeds. <clears throat> Container gardens like raised beds give better drainage. So there's things like citrus or lemon myrtle that don't like clay soil and so that it, sometimes it's an option to grow things in pots instead of in the ground. Uh, you might have a balcony like this person on the bottom left hand corner where 
They hardly had any, they had one big raised bed, but they wanted more space, more garden, I should say. So the only way to get that was to put in pots and fill them with potting mix to grow their, their dwarf fruit trees. And foam fruit boxes, of course, are fantastic for renters. And you do need to, as I mentioned, repot every three years. And of course, you must water regularly because the plants in pots don't have the ability to move their roots out and get extra water from the surrounding soil like plants in gardens do. So they're much less forgiving or they, they can't, they, they don't have access to anything else. Come on, little computer. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that for the recording. Uh, so Nature Strip, also called in other states, Verge Gardens. Of please, of course, please check with your local council, and Lee would definitely like me to say that, uh, with, re with regard to regulations and permits. Always check possible soil contamination. I know we've mentioned them already, but it's really good to know about the Veggie Safe program. They're a great spot to grow herbs and plants that are able to be shared, because remember, this is not your land, this is a public space. So you can expect to harvest something, but you also can't expect to harvest something. So things that are great to grow are things that have multiple harvests. So rosemary, people always like taking a little bit of rosemary, and also things that will survive the odd dog rambling through or a child jumping through to get a ball. Flat leaf parsley is also great. And I know that my, my nature strip garden in Melbourne keeps a lot of the neighbours in flat leaf parsley because it just keeps self seeding. Nasturtiums are also quite good because they're able to be used for their edible flowers and their, their beautiful spicy leaves in salads and of course their seeds too. So they have multiple uses and they're a bit rambling, but they're, they're great and pretty to have on a nature strip as well, nature strip garden. And various thyme plants are good because yeah, they can be used for edging to help keep mulch in. Uh, kale is also great because again, you've got a long-term harvest. I used to like growing dwarf or semi-dwarf broad beans and people would just pick a little broad bean or two as they were growing, as they walked past and nibble on those. And leafy lettuces again, because you're harvesting by the leaf. And little signs like this are really useful. So this one is, please don't pick me yet, I'm a baby. And behind there, there's a sign, I think for river mint or native mint. Or could be parsley. I can't see from here. So little signs are really helpful. And I know that people have set up things like, I mean, I occasionally have a share basket at my front gate with excess chocos or pajoas. And other people put out seeds or seedlings for their neighbours. And and there's, it's quite a, um, it's becoming quite a thing throughout various parts of Australia to have not just little book libraries, share libraries but seed libraries too and I have thought that I would like to do that in my garden and my front garden. So now we finally get to some actual varieties and so I've called these easy peasy just because they're really easy to grow. So for spring planting which is what you'd be looking at now and this by all means is not um, doesn't cover everything but it gives you a really good selection to choose from. Uh, so leafy greens such as bok choy now you know, they're, they're brassicas, so they can get um, cabbage, white cabbage butterfly, so that can be a problem. But they're so quick to grow and quick to harvest, so I wanted to include those for that reason because they're really rewarding. Silver beet and also um, silver beet's fancier cousin, red uh, five-coloured chard, I should say, or also sometimes just red chard, are uh, really, really beautiful. I much prefer the rainbow chard or the five color chard to silver beet. It's exactly the same plant, it's just different color stems and leaf veins, but really long-term plant to grow and harvest over a very long period. I mean, you're talking six months or more, you can harvest that with any luck. Leafy lettuces, if you don't have a flush of hot water, you can harvest them for months. Kale, again, some varieties I've had last two years on my nature strip garden, others, only a few months but you know they really vary so you can play around with those and they're they're really useful celery there's so many different varieties celery again harvest by the the stem the outside stem spring onions very uh, you can they, they're so easy that you can you don't even have to split them up when you plant them you can buy a punnet or even as a friend of mine does buy spring onions when they're on sale in the supermarket and being thrown out or just about thrown out, and he plants those into the garden. Okay, they're not organic in that way, but he plonks them in the garden and they just keep living. And even though they've been harvested, been through a supermarket and come and come out the other end, they'll still grow, and, or usually they still grow. 
if they've still got their roots on them. They're, they're incredibly hardy vegetables. The other thing you can do is just cut off your spring onions just above ground level and they'll just re regrow again as leeks often do too. The spring onions are definitely the easiest. And of course, don't ignore the green tops of them. They're really good for stir fries. Generally, when I harvest my spring onions, I use the lower half or one third, which is more white. I use that as an onion substitute because bulbing or bulbing onions, I just find they're just too hard to grow. I just use spring onions or leek. It's much easier. And in the top, I save and I chop those up and use them in stir fries or, you know, that kind of cooking or to add to, say, um, you know, as a little flavouring with, uh, with uh, you know, cooking salmon or tofu or something like that. Uh, just add it in as a little bit of fried spring onion on, on the side of it. Now, cherry tomatoes I've put in as, a, as an easy growing plant because cherry tomatoes are way more forgiving than the large fruited tomatoes. And just remember that cherry can include large cherry. So, you know, your usual cherries are quite small, but you can have large cherries such as Sweet Bite and Tommy Toe. And Tommy Toe is the heirloom one that you can save the seeds of. But there's quite a lot of um, large cherries that are worth growing. And I mean, Tommy Toe often top, um, is the best tasting tomato in taste tests. It's super easy to grow. It is a vining or indeterminate, which can also translate into the word triffid. So they are pretty wild and hard to control, but um, they'll just keep growing and producing for many, many months. So they're good value. And they're also able to be grown in a little bit more shade, which is something that can be a problem in, um, in some people's gardens. Now, bush beans and climbing beans, bush beans are quicker to produce, but you can harvest over a shorter period. Climbing beans take longer to produce or to start producing a harvest, but they, they do so over a very long period. Pumpkins are quite easy, as long as you've got bees to pollinate. If not, then look, do, uh, do some Googling on um, hand pollinating your pumpkins which, or, or, and zucchinis. And if you're not getting any, don't make the mistake of thinking when you see a tiny fruit on your pumpkin or zucchini, that that's it. Because in actual fact, the female flowers produce, that's how you know which ones are the female, <coughs> excuse me, female flowers, is they produce a small fruit at the base of the flower. And then if that is pollinated, it continues to grow. If that small pumpkin or zucchini withers and drops off, then that flower was not pollinated. And so the flowers that don't have the small fruit at the base are your male flowers. And they're the ones you can use the, the little yellow parts in the middle, the internal parts to dab on to the fem to the, to the much more buried um, flower parts of the, of the female flowers. And you have a little bit of flower sex. And um, I think I'm allowed to say that it's, it's after um, the hour that, some children would have gone to bed. I don't know. Anyway, that's what you're doing, and you're pollinating the flat. You're pollinating the vegetables anyway. In autumn, again, you can plant spring onions and celery, and they're something that are generally planted um, spring and autumn because, as the weather changes in those seasons, the ones that you've planted in spring will tend to go to seed in autumn, and ones that you plant in autumn will tend to go to seed in spring. So that, that's a bit of a change over time. And it also means that if you plant those things just before one of those major changeover times and they suddenly go to seed, you're thinking, oh, what happened there? So if you, if you plant your spring onions in the middle of summer, they might go to seed quite quickly in, um, in autumn. So just bear in mind that you want to stick, stick to those two main planting times for those things. And the same with kale, they can be planted spring or autumn. Snow peas are really good to plant in autumn in Melbourne and peas because then they get going, they sit and not do very much through winter. So they come up, they go along, go along, go along. And then in spring, they're ready to take off because you want them to be producing flowers now so that you've got a good month or so of fruiting before the hot weather hits in a bang, which it does in Melbourne. And then all of a sudden they go to, they, they finish off and they stop producing flowers. <coughs> Broad beans are also good to put in in autumn. Perpetual spinach is really similar to silver beet, but if you do have a lot more shade, then that is the leafy veggie for you. <clears throat> Radish is also quite good 
And as um, Anne, a friend of mine, reminded me, radish is much tastier when planted in autumn, even though you can plant it in spring. They get much hotter and spicier in spring and they're nicer when they're planted in winter in autumn. And of course, you can plant bok choy in autumn and mizuna, which is another really fabulous Asian green that's good for salads or for very small amounts of cooking. <clears throat> so this is a little slide to show you the difference between, or just to sort of discuss the difference between seed raising or plant or versus, um, so whether you want to raise your seeds versus plant them straight out. So, and just to some of the discussion around that. So larger seeds like peas and beans and also root vegetables like, like, um, like uh, well, root vegetables generally, even though beetroot has large seeds and carrot does not, even though they're both root vegetables, you are better to direct sow both of those. So those things are good not to be bought as seedlings. However, you can do a bit of, uh, and this is what's shown in the second picture there, a bit of pre-sprouting. And that's something I like to do. And I've got videos on my YouTube, Karen Sutherland YouTube channel, and you can look those up. I think I've got endless stuff about um, pre-sprouting seeds because I, I really like to do it. And so in that case, you can raise peas and beans that way, and then you can plant them out. But they don't like so much being planted um, from, from seedling punnets, even though nurseries do sell them, the beans and peas as seedlings, that it's not actually advisable to, to buy them that way if possible. And they are really dead easy to plant. You simply poke them into the ground with your finger. Soaking them overnight is also good. <clears throat> and um, that's something I was trying to draw attention to with a little video the other day. And yeah, just soaking overnight in warm water is a really good way to activate larger seeds. Uh, if you're going to grow smaller seeds, so le leafy lettuces, for instance, then they're much better, they're much easier to tackle in a container with a really nice, fine seed raising mix. I know it's a lot of information at this hour of the night. Sorry, everybody. Um, <clears throat> you then need to, if you've got things self-seeding, you need to thin and move your seedlings and Planting, from, planting as a seedling is good for hard to grow plants and also warm climate plants. So you give them a head start in a warmer situation. Uh, and there's some issues for you to think about that seedlings can dry out easily. If they don't get enough light, they stretch or etiolate. And you also need to work through hardening them off to getting, getting them ready to transplant. And I've just realized that I need to move through these a little bit more quickly. <clears throat> so this as a reference for you later, are plants that are better to be planted as seeds and others that are better to be planted as seedlings. And those little biodegradable pots there are just compressed cardboard. And if you want to raise things until they're a little bit larger, then before you plant them out, and the biodegradable pots means that you don't get transplant shock. So it can be quite good for a number of different plants and a number of different reasons. You do need to remember that you're going to have to, with vegetable gardens, in, um, go through maintenance. So um, this just gives you the variation between seasons and how much water you might need to do and the perspective that no mulch in winter is better and mulch is necessary in summer, very, very necessary, and that you're going to have to train, or train and prune your um, climbing plants such as tomatoes and beans and to some extent zucchinis almost every day. So you're going to have to do something to all of them every single day. And there's a vast variety of pests and, and from insects to large creatures such as possums that you're going to have to protect your garden from. And if you're just beginning your garden, you're going to learn about the different pests there are and the different, the different protections you can use. So um, I won't go through all of these in detail because we're running a little bit short on time because I've... Um, rambled on too much, I apologise. It's really easy to do that. It's such a big topic. But I suffice to say, I wanted to get you to understand that, that there's lots of beneficial insects which are often confused with pests. And we've got a really big reference slide at the end for this. So try to look these up online. And there's, you know, Facebook and online resources now make it so much easier. So I've just tried to give you here as a reference. On the left-hand side, you've got ladybird eggs, larvae, or, or nymph, I should say. And adult, and on the right hand side, you've got la uh, lace wings. So, both of these are beneficial insects. And another one that's very beneficial is praying mantis and also hoverflies. So, 
if you do some Googling on those and also revise these notes when you get them later and have a look at the video again, you'll find that these insects are really fantastic and you don't want to confuse the, the nymph stage in particular with a pest, which often happens. And these creatures are doing a lot of gardening for you without you having to even do much beside. Provide them with flowers and space and don't use sprays. So um, even, organic, even organic sprays are going to affect beneficial insects. So bear that in mind. And that little spray bottle in the middle there is actually just water being used on seedlings, in on tomato seedlings, in Cat Laver's little handmade, homemade um, seedling raising um, made out of an old barbecue. So there's some pests. I've just given you some example of pests and some low impact options for you to use and then stronger options, but only when you absolutely have to. And again, this is a super broad topic that you could fill up an entire um, presentation with just on pests but it just gives you some idea that it can if you can possibly just blast off with water or use a soap spray or just or just use barriers um, then you're going to have um, better beneficial insects building up and providing flowers for them in the garden as well really really important and again the low impact solutions are always the best which is things like pruning excess leaves to allow more airflow Believe it or not, just adding organic matter to your soil is listed for lots of diseases as a way of preventing some of them from occurring, even some of the really significant tomato diseases. So um, there's also milk sprays to prevent powdery mildew. Very, very simple things like good soil, allowing good airflow around your plants and avoiding overhead watering, so watering at, at ground level. And mulching too keeps soil temperatures um, regulated. You can avoid a whole raft of diseases and pests by just doing those things. So don't get too overwhelmed by what could go wrong and instead set things up properly in the beginning and you'll get better results and less problems. So here's some of the ways you can protect your pests and uh, just little collars with cutting the bottoms off a plastic pot is really, really useful. And because they're UV stable plastic, they last for years and years and years. You can reuse them, just give them a little wash between use. And I use that because there's so many different pests up here. And I also don't, I try not to put mulch around the base of each pot, um, inside of each pot until the plant gets going, because I've got all sorts of pests like slaters that are not even meant to be a pest, but they've caused problems. So um, also growing them in the top right hand corner, you'll see the biodegradable pots and growing things until they're larger is another way of getting them to a stronger size before you plant them out. And good old um, old wire hanging baskets upside down are quite good to protect things and crushed eggshells. There's, there's a raft of protection methods you'll find online and by Googling. So it's more to get, keep, get you aware that you will need to protect seedlings. You can't just put them out there and, and ignore them or you will find them eaten off at ground level or dug out by some blackbird. And netting. So you can see up the top there that I've got some extensive netting going on and here's where I've raised it to allow insects to come in, beneficial insects to come in at different times of the day. You can also use net, and I get a lot of benefit from having this net on in summer. It just knocks the worst of the heat off the day. Uh, you can also buy specific fruit fly netting and exclusion bags because fruit fly is becoming a whole issue in Victoria. If you are using any kind of mesh and you'll see what that mesh is there, it, um, you, you mustn't have anything less than five millimeter by five millimeter at full stretch. And that's a new Victorian standard that's come in, which prevents us using a lot of our old netting. And that is because it was tangling birds and wildlife. So it's um, just simply not allowed anymore. So be aware of that. Um, harvesting, you need to harvest regularly and that allows you to, well, it encourages continuous brooding of all the legumes it also means that you're getting a lot you're getting a longer harvest period so don't wait till the end to harvest a big bok choy although you can see I've just harvested a great big one there because it was about to go to seed but you can also ha harvest your bok choy quite often by leaving two or three leaves at the base and you'll often get the whole plant regrowing again now that depends if you've got the space to do that and of course use as many things as you can. So, you know, if you're harvesting a beetroot, you can take some of those leaves and cook the older ones into a mixed cooked greens or use the younger ones in salad. So, you know, the key to getting as much out of a small garden or an urban garden as possible is, is using 
everything is as, in as many ways as possible. Uh, this is just a good little slide to refer to later to say that you might only you might not even have lettuces in your garden, but you if you can grow a range of these other plants in your garden, then you've got a gourmet salad straight away, and you'd be amazed at what you can pick when you've got things, especially if you make sure to grow some edible flowers, such as nasturtiums and pansies or violas. So it's amazing what you can grow and pick a few weeds as well, like dandelions, young dandelion leaves. Uh, now, as I mentioned, herbs have a really high environmental impact. So um, try to grow some pots of herbs near your door to allow for easy picking for when you're cooking. And that's a permaculture idea that you're, that you're having things really close to your back door, which is designated as zone one. So they're things that you're using frequently for teas or for cooking. And I've just given you some herbs for sunny spots there and also some herbs for the shade because many of us do have a lot of shade. There's always a plant for something. And here's a nice little list of herbal tea if you'd like to grow your own herbal teas. So some of the native plants and also lemon verbena and mint, many, many types of mints. That should be mints, not mint. <laughs> lemon mint, apple mint, ginger mint, chocolate mint. Because you, so you can refer back to these later. And then we've got some detailed slides. So I won't go through these, but these are a good reference for you later. So I've got a particular interest in native food plants. So I've got some nice information for you there. And this native mint is um, indigenous or local native to, Mel to the Melbourne area, all over Melbourne. So that's a nice indigy one for you. Um, these are some of the fruiting plants and I apologize that we're having to deal with this quite quickly, but I will zip through it a bit more quickly for you. And these are some fruiting plants for sunny areas and also shady areas. So I've tried to put in things that are relatively easy. Now the thornless blackberry, there's a mistake there that should actually specify Waldo because thornless blackberry is massive. So you should only use the compact variety or, well, unless you have a massive space, you will struggle to control that. So uh, I would advise only using the, the compact form called Waldo, W-A-L-D-O. And there's a variety of citruses Babago is a bit more unusual, but it does it does grow very fruit very prolifically, so you can use those as reference. Um, a lot of be berries are easier than you think, so we just put in a little bit of um, a slide about that, showing them trained over a arch, and that's in Ang Angelo Eliardi's beautiful garden. They're a lot easier than you think. Strawberries, as I mentioned, grow really well in foam fruit boxes, and here they are on my garage roof in Melbourne looking a bit messy with that's the nets uh, years ago before we had to not we're not allowed to use those nets anymore so um, bear in mind that is not a correct net size but very prolific because it's in full sun if you have shady areas you can grow alpine strawberries so these are a great plant to grow they respond well to water so by using regular watering and and feeding them like a like a crop you'll get very good results and they have intense flavour, even though they're quite small. Rhubarb is just a fantastic plant. Just remember, if you don't already know, that the leaves are poisonous, so you only use the, the um, stems. Uh, when they flower in spring, you take those flowering stems off to make the fruit, the plant last longer. And there are many varieties of rhubarb and some of them are um, more productive in, in um, a different, a, sorry, all throughout the year, so things like Everred, but have a good look at the description of your rhubarb variety that you're looking at buying. Fajoas are also super easy to grow. They do take a bit more time to fruit. They take about five years to fruit and they take up a bit of space, but you can keep them pruned. Uh, if you don't, if you're not gonna be staying in your garden for a long period of time, then it's probably not the best plant to put in. But if you know you're gonna be there for a while, they're a great plant to grow. In theory, they only need one, but they do one plant, but they do fruit better if you have two. They are a very particular taste, but I quite love them. Tamarillos are also really, really prolific. They are red and yellow varieties, but they um, they last about seven years in the garden, but they they take a couple of years to fruit. Very long fruiting and very easy to grow. There's many, many forms of citrus. And I'd recommend compact forms. Finger limes, again, I'm just skimming over here, I apologize. Finger limes are something you could really consider. 
they need just as much water and nutrients as, and also the protection from citrus gall wasp that the non-native citrus do, but they do tolerate quite a lot of shade, which is quite useful. Lily pillies, you can see on the left, a tree version, on the right, a pot version. I just want to point out, you know, just some unusual things that you can grow in your garden. Midgen berries, a very good native food plant for shade. And there's a little bit about preserving, which I'm gonna flick through and a little bit about harvesting and drying. So you've got this as a really good reference later and that's it. <laughs> sorry, that was a really fast end. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that was a wealth of amazing information. Now, I'll just show we... you, there's a yeah. lot of references here. So oh, there's fantastic. stacks of references, yeah. Oh, wow. so. You could explore all that mm. to your heart's content. Yeah, because so we that's will there send for you this to out. use, yeah. Mm. We will send this out to everybody. And there are a couple of unanswered questions here, but I do realise it's right on eight, so I do appreciate that some of you may have to go. But I do, do you have a couple of minutes? I'm happy to, to, yeah, I'm happy to answer, to answer these. There's a couple of questions here, but to everyone else, thank you so much. Or of course, stick around to hear the answer to these questions. And I uh, really appreciate you coming along tonight and we'll get those uh, references and the presentation and the links out to you. Could you also uh, take, a couple of minutes maybe to fill out a survey I send you just to give us feedback on tonight. That would be really awesome. But um, in the meantime, we've got a couple of little questions here. One from AJ uh, asking about adding crushed eggs, shells and or tea leaves to your garden bed. Is that something you would recommend? Um, you can use crushed egg shells around seedlings to stop snails and slugs crossing over. If you put them onto your garden bed, they do release calcium, but very, very slowly because they take a long time to break down. So if you're putting them into your compost, they should, if every time you use an eggshell or use an egg, oh, thanks Elizabeth, because I'm a little bit, um, she says, clear your presentation, but I do apologize for the end being so rushed. Um, you really need to crunch them up in your hand into really small pieces because they take a long time to break down. So it's generally not advised to put anything uncomposted onto your garden bed, particularly don't put it onto potting mix on pots. Things need to go into compost heaps to be composted. So, and the only main exception to that is, as I said, using eggshells to prevent snails getting to seedlings, or if you're putting coffee grounds on for the reason of, keeping snail or killing snails or keeping them at bay but putting lots of coffee gr grounds on don't put it on potting mix but if you're putting them on your garden beds it can uh, cause nitrogen drawdown in as the coffee grounds break down and so you end up with soil being nitrogen deficient so you don't end up you end up causing a problem rather than helping so in most cases it's better to put everything through the lovely filter of a compost uh, situation so everything gets modified it's a bit like I know this is going to take a little bit longer to explain but I read this lovely analogy in a Chinese food book saying that in a soup or a stew all the plants have had their just arguments with each other all the foods sorry have had their arguments with each other and so it's very easy for the body to take those things up whereas those individual foods have different ways of interacting with people's bodies or stomach but in a super stew, it's all being cooked together. And so it's a very harmonious way of taking all those things in at the same time. And so that's a really good analogy, I think, with compost, that everything's already been broken down into a good form. And so it's a lovely way for the garden to take them up, take it up. And yeah, there's a lovely suggestion from Lou there to say baking eggshells, which is also important if you're going to feed them to your chickens. But that's I didn't know that, that that was easier for um, composting that to break. That's great. Thank you. All right, and then there was one other question uh, about passion fruit. Mm. Oh, yes, uh, I, I was going to answer that. Um, yeah. Look, climbers, uh, they have as many leaves as trees. So imagine a great big tree trying to grow in this tiny little pot. It just doesn't have enough capacity to hold moisture. Making it a wicking pot could help, but I, I have seen people grow passion fruits in um, wine barrels, so uh, pots that are, say, 80 centimetres across a diameter at least, and maybe 80 centimetres deep, but they're always going to grow better in the ground. And one other point about passion fruits that's really important if you're going to try and grow them, you don't need to, 
Uh, but you need to if you want a succession plan because they only last about seven years. So once you, you don't need to for fruiting because they're self-fertilizing. You do need bees. So if you don't see bees around, then you might have to hand pollinate. Uh, but if you plant one and it starts fruiting really well and you've got the space, then you, if you plant another one, then you'll, um, you, won't have a, you, you won't have a break in your fruiting. You'll have continuity of fruiting. But I don't think you're going to get the best success in passion fruit growing in pots. If you want a climate, a fruiting climate to grow in pots, look for a self-pollinating kiwi, which is kiwi isai. I'll just type the um, kiwi isai um, fruits in pots. Believe it or not, it actually, when it's really tiny, mm -hmm. can grow, start growing fruits. So amazing. Brilliant. Wow. I think I think we covered all the questions. Um, oh. So Sorry. kiwi berry, up. that is. Kiwi berry. Okay. Yeah, it's a miniature kiwi, I should say. <laughs> Look, All that's right. just a beginning anyway. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Karen. That was amazing uh, and so thorough and really comprehensive. Uh, really uh, appreciate um, really you uh, dedicating the time today. And thank you so much for everyone for coming. Um, and have a really great evening. And uh, yes, stay tuned for the uh, references and so forth to come out to you in the next few days. Mm, yeah, thanks for, thanks for your questions, everyone, too. Thank so, you. Yeah, that's fantastic. Really great questions. Mm -hmm. Bye, everybody. Everyone. Good night. Dream about night. your veggie gardens tonight. <laughs>